As lawlessness spreads out like a dark cloud over the entire earth, there aren't many words in the English language more powerful or more misunderstood than the word love. In the 1960s, anti-war protesters marched carrying signs with the words, Make love, not war. In this way, they attempted to redefine the word love to make it synonymous with rampant sexual immorality. In the 1970s, homosexuals carried signs that declared, Gay love, it's the real thing. Meanwhile, they committed acts the Bible calls abominations and claimed love was the justification for their sin. Then, in 2015, after the Supreme Court of the United States legalized homosexual marriage, those old immoral slogans were retired as the state-sponsored celebrations of lawlessness began. The protesters of the 60s and the 70s revealed they were now occupying the key positions of national power and sinners rejoiced while they proudly hoisted signs that proclaimed love wins. Thus, several years after the Oberfell Hodges case was wrongly decided in the U.S. Supreme Court, deceived people everywhere proudly parade signs that say, love is love. And they gleefully display that particular phrase because they now believe that homosexual marriages are just as valid an expression of love as any heterosexual marriage. With this background in mind, we should ask, does the Bible record any righteous, biblically approved love between people of the same gender? And the answer is absolutely. However, the Bible never records any righteous person expressing sensual love towards someone of the same gender. In fact, Scripture strictly prohibits such expressions of love. Please consider, do you love your mother, grandmother, father or grandfather? Would the love you have for your grandparents or your parents lead you to want to marry them? Could such love righteously express itself sensually? Absolutely not. Obviously, there are different types of love. Therefore, the slogan, love is love, is a dangerous lie. The love we have for our parents is different from the love we have for our spouse. And by redefining and twisting the English word love, Satan is causing lawlessness to increase exponentially. So now that we understand the betrothal perspective and what the Bible actually teaches about the children of God and the children of the devil, we're ready to begin addressing the topic of love as it's described in Scripture. But we must begin by noting the Septuagint was the name given to the ancient Greek translation of the scriptures that Jesus and his apostles quoted from whenever they cited a passage from Genesis to Malachi. And in the Septuagint, there are three very different Greek words used in scripture that are all translated into English as the single word love. The Greek noun eros describes sensual love, and this type of love places a higher value on a particular person or group over others for sensual or physical reasons. The Greek verb phileo describes relational love, and this type of love places a higher value on a particular person or group over others for experiential or relational reasons. And the Greek noun agape was eventually used in scripture to describe redemptive love. And this type of love places a higher value on a particular person or group over others for spiritual or redemptive reasons. 
Each expression of love involves valuing a person or a particular group over others. However, the reasons for the higher evaluation change when discussing the three forms of love. For example, Eros love values one person above other people for physical or sensual reasons and expresses itself in physically intimate ways. Therefore, this type of love must only ever be expressed privately towards a spouse inside a biblically sanctioned lifelong marriage between one biological man and one biological woman. Consequently, all non-marital expressions of Eros love are labeled sexual immorality in the Bible. And to help us see how the concept of Eros is portrayed in Scripture, we should note in the Septuagint the Greek word Eros was used in Proverbs 7.18 within a sinful invitation issued by a wicked adulteress. There the word was clearly used to describe a form of sensual love expressed between two people. Before describing her house is the way to hell, leading down to the chambers of death. Proverbs recorded the immoral woman saying, Come, and let us enjoy love until the morning. Come, and let us embrace in love, for my husband is not at home, but has gone on a long journey. The second word translated as love in this passage is the Greek term eros and it clearly describes a physical manifestation of sensual passion. Plus, in this case, it was a sinful expression of Eros love being discussed, a sin that the Bible calls adultery. Meanwhile, between a husband and his wife, Eros love is something God designed from the very beginning. Therefore, Jesus said, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Jesus was quoting the text of the book of Genesis from a time before the fall of mankind. There the Bible described the origin of marriage and the purpose of what later became known as Eros love. And that purpose is to bring a husband and his wife together as one flesh. Marital Eros love was the basis of how Adam and Eve could fulfill God's command to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. However, when Eros love is taken out of the context of biblical marriage, it always becomes sinful. Then, even as it might result in the fruit of physical life, it simultaneously brings forth the fruit of spiritual death. This is why Scripture explains marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Truly, Eros love is a wonderful thing that God designed, but only in the private context of a biblically approved marriage. However, Satan has twisted the good thing that God created in order to tempt the world into expressing Eros love in sinful ways. Therefore, the Apostle Paul warned the saints in Corinth, Do you not know? that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Through the cross of Jesus, only those who repent of the sins of fornication, adultery, homosexuality, sodomy, idolatry, theft, covetousness, drunkenness, reviling, or extortion can inherit the kingdom of God. 
But those who refuse to repent of these sins will inherit the cursed darkness of hell. And the fact is, four of the ten sins listed in 1 Corinthians 6.9 involve expressing Eros love in forbidden ways that violate the righteous laws of God our Creator. So now that we understand how Eros love must be reserved for marriage and marriage must be defined as the lifelong union of one biological man and one biological woman, just as God designed when he created Adam and Eve. We can move on to the next type of love. In English translations of the Bible, the Greek word phileo is also translated love. But unlike Eros loves sensual method of evaluation, Phileo love values one person above another for experiential or relational reasons. Therefore, this type of love is typically expressed within a family or some similar relationship where two or more people are experientially connected by some common values, location, community, covenant, or ancestry. Consequently, Phileo love can be defined as relational love. When Paul wrote, admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, he used the root of the word phileo twice. And the phileo love described here between family members is based on the fact that they have experienced a familial relationship with one another. Paul did not command the young women to express phileo love towards someone else's husband or children. No, he commanded them to express phileo love toward their own husbands and children. But phileo love is more than just love for our natural families. Because Christians should have phileo love toward their spiritual brothers and sisters in the family of God, Paul wrote to Titus, all who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. And the word translated love in that passage is phileo. In fact, Jesus used the same word when he said, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me so we must love jesus relationally more than our earthly families to be worthy of him when we consider the bible's teachings this is logical since our earthly familial relationships only last a lifetime but our spiritual relationship with jesus will last forever we might even conclude this type of spiritual logic led Jesus to say, My mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. So, phileo love definitely applies to our spiritual family in Christ, and it should be even more intense than the phileo love we have towards our earthly families, especially if some of our earthly family members do not love the Jesus revealed in the Holy Bible. After all, we can be statistically sure that Paul the Apostle had some family members who did not love the Lord Jesus. Yet Paul himself wrote, If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Paul used the Greek word phileo in this passage, a passage that curses anyone who does not love Jesus with experiential, relationship-based love. And Jesus mentioned this same type of love when he said, The Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. Just as we discovered in our previous studies 
regarding the betrothal perspective and how we become children of God through our relationship with Jesus, our Lord makes it clear that the Father loves us with phileo love. And he does this because we love Jesus with phileo love and demonstrate our phileo love by becoming his disciples. Likewise, Jesus used the word phileo when he said, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Jesus does not shepherd every child of Adam with his rod of rebuke and chastening. No, only God's children, the sheep of the Messiah, experience the good shepherd's rod and staff. Meanwhile, to become part of God's flock, every child of Adam must first hear the voice of Jesus as recorded in his word, and decide to follow him. Truly, these passages that use the word phileo prove we should have an experiential, relational love toward Jesus, the Father, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and even our earthly families, especially towards our spouse and children, if applicable. And phileo love is clearly based on valuing such people higher than others, specifically because we have actively experienced ongoing relationships with them. Meanwhile, neither phileo love or eros love is mentioned in Paul's famous teaching on love found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. No, in that passage, the Greek word Paul used for love was agape. There, Paul explained, Agape love is slow to become angry, and it operates in kindness. Agape love does not boast about itself, nor does it puff itself up in pride. Agape love never conducts itself in shameful ways, and it never selfishly seeks after its own gain. Agape love is not easily provoked to anger, and it doesn't count up all of the harmful things done to it. Finally, agape love never rejoices at unrighteousness. Instead, agape love rejoices together with the truth. This is how the Bible describes agape love, and... This is how the Bible describes our amazing God. After all, the Apostle John wrote, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Obviously, when John wrote, God is love, he used the word agape. So Paul was describing God in 1 Corinthians at the same time he described agape love. Also, Paul told us we should each live out the agape love he described by writing later, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. Yes, as those who have received such great agape love from God, we must walk in agape love toward others. And God showed us stunning agape love while we were still his enemies. So Paul wrote, God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God, 
through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Using Paul's language, we can say, while we were still sinners in the past tense, we were enemies of God. But God sent his only begotten Son, and Jesus willingly laid down his innocent life to reconcile us to himself, to justify us by his own blood, and redeem us from Satan's kingdom of darkness. And because God showed such amazing agape love to us while we were still his enemies, our master taught us. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you and do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. We don't love our enemies because we're physically attracted by Eros love. Likewise, we don't love our enemies because we're in a relationship with them that would generate phileo love. No, friends, we love our enemies because we desire to be like our glorious Father in heaven who showed us agape love while we were still his enemies. Our Father in heaven shows agape love to his enemies because he doesn't desire that anyone suffer the eternal agonies of hell. And we know this is true, because the apostle Peter declared, The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some count slowness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Friend, God does not want anyone to be eternally separated from him in the lake of fire and sulfur that is the second death. Instead, God desires that all should come to repentance. So God showed great agape love to the world by sending his only begotten Son. And Jesus showed great agape love by laying down his life to save all who will come to the Father through him. Likewise, God shows great agape love to the world each day by bringing rain, by sending sunshine, by supplying food, by sustaining life, and by providing us with many wonderful gifts to enjoy. But if someone rejects God's many displays of agape love, it will eventually lead to their doom. Therefore, Paul wrote, Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds. Yes, God will render eternal life to those who, by patient continuance in doing good, seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory, honor and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. 
friends, sin is like an ocean. And God's agape love is like a life preserver, mercifully tossed out from the safety of the shore to save those who are in the process of drowning. If someone takes hold of God's agape love by repenting, Jesus will rescue them from the waters of sin so they can experience the phileo love of God. Yes, as people betrothed to Jesus Christ, people who repent become covenant sons and daughters of God. And because of these divine relationships, they then know God's sanctifying phileo love. But if someone keeps refusing the agape love of God. Friends, they will never know his phileo love. Instead, they will eventually die in their sin and face the indignation, wrath, tribulation, and anguish of Satan's eternal destiny. Therefore, to imitate our God who is love, we must show agape love to those who treat us wrongfully. We must pray for them, do good to them, and bless them. And we do this because, like God, we don't want anyone to perish. No, we all desire that all people come to repentance before it is too late, so they can experience the glorious phileo love of both the Father and the Son. And because we are commanded to show agape love, even to our enemies, we can call agape love redemptive love. And it is this redemptive love that patiently endures the hostilities and injustices sinners commit, all because it desires sinners to repent and enter into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, do you remember how we said earlier each expression of love involves valuing a person or a particular group over others. It is obvious that proper expressions of Eros love involve a person valuing their spouse over all others in physical ways. And expressions of phileo love involve a person valuing people they have certain things in common with, such as physical or spiritual ancestry, values, interests, or any other type of relationship foundation. But when it comes to agape love, who takes second place so we can value those we show agape love to more than someone else? Well, because redemptive agape love requires those who demonstrate it to be meek and kind, even while patiently enduring wrongs, agape love actually requires us to prioritize others over ourselves. And this means that we can also call agape love self-sacrificial love. Therefore, Paul wrote, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Likewise, Paul commanded, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another. Truly, these passages teach us how to love as Jesus loves. However, even self-sacrificial, redemptive, agape love does not seek to establish or maintain deep relationships with unrepentant sinners who are living in rebellion to God, especially because that rebellion will land such people in hell. 
Therefore, because we love them, Scripture declares, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them, and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Truly nowhere in Scripture are we commanded to show the biblical phileo love that characterizes relationships towards unrepentant sinners. Instead, friends, we are instructed to show both phileo and agape love to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is why Scripture also declares, I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. Christians are commanded to withdraw all expressions of phileo love from anyone who calls themselves a brother or sister in the Lord if they practice sin and refuse to repent. We still have agape love for such people, and we desire for them to repent of their sins before it is too late. But their sin brings separation. Meanwhile, if such a person demonstrates genuine repentance, they should be joyfully welcomed back into relationship. Therefore, repentance is the key to the restoration of phileo love. As Jesus said, Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. According to our Lord, the forgiveness that restores relationships and all expressions of phileo love is preconditioned to require repentance. Therefore, the words, I repent, are the key that opens the door of restoration and reconciliation with God and with his true church. And this begins to reveal how the foundational phileo love that all relationships are built on is conditional, according to the Bible. After all, phileo love is expressed within relationships, where two or more people are connected by common interests, values, community, or ancestry. Yes, Jesus used the word phileo when he explained his own relationship with the Father. He said, the Father loves the Son and shows the Son all things that he himself does. And the Father will show the Son greater works than these that you may marvel. Likewise, Jesus used the word phileo when he explained our relationship with the Father by saying, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. But not everyone can say they enjoy God's phileo love. No, friends, only those betrothed to God's Son and welcomed into God's family as children of God 
can make that claim. And this is why we had to discover what the Bible has to say about those biblical relationships before we learned about the three Greek words we translate into English as love. Truly many who call Jesus Lord, Lord, are counting on God's agape love to save them. But they have not actually repented of their sins to take hold of God's amazing agape love. If they would only repent, then they would experience the life-changing phileo love of Jesus Christ that actually leads to transformation. But because they refuse to repent and enter into an obedient, submissive relationship with Jesus, one day the Lord will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Friends, Jesus is omniscient. He knows everything, including all those he will say these words to. So why does Jesus tell these doomed souls, I never knew you? Well, the answer is, Jesus is using the word no to refer to experiencing phileo, relationship love with a person. These people will have known Jesus like most people know George Washington. I've never met George Washington. I've never experienced a relationship with him. And if I were to meet George Washington, he would say, I never knew you. Likewise, many people know about Jesus, but they don't actually know Jesus experientially and relationally. Therefore, John tells us all how to test if we really know Jesus in a saving way. Our brother John explains, Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, but doesn't keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth isn't in him. Those who have experienced both the agape love and phileo love of Jesus have learned Jesus did not abolish his commandments. No, instead, Jesus taught them, reinforced them, and commanded his apostles to do the same. But friends, people who do not know Jesus experientially through a covenant relationship with him cannot see through Satan's lawless lies. So, they fail to perceive that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Meanwhile, we who truly know Jesus experientially must remember the Bible has three distinct words for love. However, translators only use one English word. So to understand all we have learned together, we must verify which Greek word is being translated when an English translation of God's word uses the word love. Also, we must distinguish between those three very different types of love when we read signs that say, make love, not war. Gay, love, it's the real thing. Love wins, and love is love. Obviously, each of those declarations is relying on people confusing eros love with Phileo love or agape love. The fact is, the sound-minded biblical Christian has no objections to two biological men or two biological women expressing phileo or agape love towards each other. No, all sound-minded students of the Bible know that Scripture only objects to people of the same biological gender 
expressing eros love towards each other. Likewise, all sound-minded students of the Bible can easily see. Eros love is very different from phileo love and agape love. But because the word love is being cheapened, tarnished, abused and twisted, many are being deceived and lawlessness is increasing and spreading out like never before. Jesus warned us about the times that would immediately herald his return by saying, Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And friends, we must not miss the fact that Jesus sees a direct connection between love and his law. About this connection, John writes, by this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. We can prove we love our brothers and sisters in Christ as well as God himself, by keeping his commandments. And the truth is, love never rejoices at unrighteousness. So those who carry signs about love while celebrating unrighteousness and the violation of God's righteous commandments have no idea what love really is. Meanwhile, because we have earnest agape love for such people. Friends, let us pray for them. Let us speak the truth to them in real redeeming love. And let us earnestly desire that they experience the phileo love of God before it's too late. After all, just after Paul explained that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, our brother Paul added, And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The love of God is calling out to the people carrying those signs, just as it called out to us. So together, let's earnestly pray that they would respond to God's amazing love by repenting. Only then can they enter into a saving covenant relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and know his phileo love. For this is the will of God revealed in the scriptures when we look to all of the Bible in the Bible alone.